Okay, um, there is no city of Cochise County, folks, so I had to fix it, right? Thank you, John, that was wonderful. And first of all, I'd like to say on behalf of all of our legislators and everyone here in Arizona and our amazing Governor Doug Ducey, we hope you all have a great time while we're here. Welcome to Arizona, we love having you. Are you enjoying this beautiful weather? Pretty nice, huh? Hopefully you brought your golf clubs. We have good golf courses here too. So thank you and welcome to Arizona. And Mr. Laffer, how are you? It's I am doing great. You. It's lovely to be back in Arizona. I don't know if you knew, but I was a resident of Arizona in 1944 and 1945. Uh, I was brought here by my grandparents. I stayed with my grandparents in, at the Pioneer Hotel in Tucson. Wow. My dad great. was on war production, so he was, and so I lived with my grandparents and there. Now you have some other experience here in Arizona, right? I do, I do. Fife Symington, I worked with him. He was one of my dearest friends, client of mine. And uh, when he was elected governor, we had a plan to remove the income tax in Arizona over full eight years to do it. And we started off, and our budget director was very skeptical about cutting tax rates and getting more revenue. But every year we put a new piece of legislation in, which cut the tax rates. We had an eight-year plan to get down to zero. Um, and uh, we were five years into it. It had been working perfectly. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was indicted and then removed from office. <laughs> so we missed, if we'd had three more years, you would be the 10th state with no income tax. <laughs> so what is it about really good elected people that try to do good about lowering taxes and they keep trying to indict us or throw us out of office? What's up with that? <laughs> You got me. <laughs> you know, it, it is sort of, you did have a secret weapon, by the way. What was that? Uh, that was California. Oh, there we go. Yeah, California under Pete Wilson was raising taxes like mad. It was like a supernova exploding, sending out solar systems of economics, some of which landed here. In fact, uh, my old neighborhood in California, we had a reunion, com most convenient, held it in Arizona. Because we'd all left. Because you'd all left. So that's why you have it here. We get yeah. that. All right, let's go to the questions, sure. right? Let's start with number one. We have enjoyed a historic economic recovery so far. How bullish are you on the continued success of the economy? Well, let me say I'm very bullish on the economy. Uh, you know, we had, I think, the best tax bill in the first term of any presidency ever. Uh, cut the statutory rate, corporate rate, from 35%, which was the highest in the OECD. By far, uh, we cut it down to 21%, which put it in the middle of the pack. Uh, we also had 100% expensing for some capital equipment. Uh, we cut the personal income tax uh, from 39.6 uh, to 37, which is good, not huge, but good. Uh, we also uh, put in the SALT deduction, a uh, thing that was no longer allowed to be deducted on your federal tax, which is wonderful for Tennessee. Just thought I'd mention that. We like that. And uh, the, the last one, which is really, really important, is we went to a global tax system, I mean, went to a, a territorial tax system as opposed to a global system, uh, which meant that US companies, every other country in the world has a territorial system, where if you pay your local taxes, that's it. You don't have to pay the US afterwards. Or we had a very big discrimination against US companies working abroad on that, and that put us through. Then we, I think that's about the best bill ever, and it's, it's bearing fruit every day. Uh, deregulation, this administration has probably been the best administration ever on deregulation by miles. Uh, and the latest one, the transparency in healthcare, if any of you get a chance to look at this, I mean, it's really big stuff. 18% of the US economy is healthcare. No one has any idea what the price of healthcare is or what the quality of the healthcare you get. I mean, how much does, how much does a CAT scan cost? No, no one knows that, not doctors don't know it. This will now be required that people will have to put it in consumable units so you know what you're buying and you know what the outcomes have been. And if you look at monetary policy, it's been okay. Not great, but it's okay. Government spending is a huge problem. And trade, I'm gonna tell you, is a work in progress. Uh, and Donald Trump is a work in progress on trade. <laughs> One day, I could, oh, I'm not tariff king. You know, he says about every phrase, just to sort of prod people and markets around. Mm -hmm. But I think this economy is set perfectly for a spectacular year next year, as long as the politics uh, doesn't get in the way. I mean, this impeachment stuff, I, I have to tell you, I, it scares the heck out of me. Uh, I don't know what's gonna happen with it, but both sides have drawn their guns and uh, someone's gonna get killed in the process and I don't know which one it's gonna be. I don't know how to focus on that. And uh, it's just very scary to me. Yeah, 
We That's agree. the only thing that really, really, I think, is the huge, huge, huge fly in the ointment. Yeah, we, we certainly agree. It is kind of a scary time. It is scary. Kind of wish Ronald Reagan was back here again to help. You know, but they went after him, too. I mean, right. you remember the Iran-Contra and the trading weapons for hostages and all that? It was horrible back then, too. I mean, and uh, if you look at Bill Clinton, I mean, look at Bill Clinton was six years of his presidency. He was under special prosecutor investigation. It started off with a, a, a land deal in Arkansas called Whitewater. Now, can any of you imagine any land deal in Arkansas that's not crooked? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just, you mentioned land deal, you got him. I mean, it, it's, just, it's just way, way, way beyond the pale. And uh, it's, it's just not, leave the presidents alone and throw them out on the voting. There you go. Very good. Okay, question number two. Given your experiences of successfully advising presidents as they, as they passed pro-growth tax reforms, what should President Trump pursue next in the arena of tax policy? Yeah. Let me, let me tell you, I'm, this is going to shock some of you. I don't know if it will shock you. Uh, in 1992, a um, very good friend of mine was the governor of California, a guy named Jerry Brown. Uh, I'd worked with him, Prop 13 we had in 78. Uh, he was really helpful with that. We got rid of the in, uh, death tax in California. We had the GAN spending limit. You know, we indexed the personal income tax. We did, I mean, really, really, and that, a lot of that is due to Jerry Brown. Um, he asked me to help him in the presidential race. He was in the Democratic primary, and I designed for him the, what I consider the perfect tax. Uh, what we did is we got rid of all federal taxes, got rid of the income tax, out of here, got rid of the payroll tax, both employer and employee, gone, corporate tax, gone, no death tax, no, in, uh, no uh, capital gains tax, no earned income tax, no Medicare, no Medicaid, got rid of every federal tax in its entirety. With, well, with one exception, uh, we kept sin taxes. Now, the reason we kept sin taxes is their purpose is not so much to raise revenues as it is to change behavior. Uh, you know, fees, fines, that stuff. Uh, I jokingly used to say, uh, we Americans don't like drunk people smoking while we shoot each other. <laughs> Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, and never mind. Uh, but that's a very small part. We got rid of all federal taxes and in their stead had two flat rate taxes. One on business net sales, that, that's if you're a Republican, that we called it that. If you're a Democrat, it's value-added tax. Mm -hmm. um, and then one personal unadjusted gross income tax with almost no deductions, uh, literally. Uh, and you replace all federal taxes with those two with no deductions, no credits, no, nothing. And if you paid ta that tax on the first dollar to the last dollar, if you had those two taxes, uh, the net sales tax and the income tax, you could statically match all federal revenues today with a tax of about 12% on each. Now, Jerry Brown tried to make it a little higher. He raised it to 13%. If, if any of you remember the race in 92 in the Democratic primary, he raised it to 13%. When we started the race, Jerry was eighth out of eight. Uh, in the end, we were coming in. We had Clinton in the crosshairs. We had just won the primary in Connecticut, and we just won the primary in Oregon. And we were coming into California, New York with a head of steam. I mean, we were going to take that little Arkansas boy out. <laughs> and Jerry coming into it three weeks before the primary announces Jesse Jackson is his running mate. Whoops. Boom. But can any of you imagine what the world would look like today? If we had a 13% flat tax, that's it. You didn't even have to file a tax return. If a company owes you 100 bucks, they, they give you 87 and they send 13 into the federal government. Uh, it's sales tax, net sales tax. They, you don't even have to touch it. They're all now. If you mow your neighbor's lawn for ten bucks, yeah, you got to send it a dollar thirty. But something like ninety-four or five percent of all taxes would be collected by businesses. No reason to file tax returns or anything. That would be it. I mean, can you imagine what this economy would look like? It's interesting. Interesting concept there, right? And and if you can win a Democratic primary with a tax plan like that. You can win the world. Yep, I think you're right. Well put. All right, could you explain to us all of this inequality economics discussion we're hearing? Yeah, I don't know if any of you have been watching the debates going on in economics in the, in the profession. There's a guy named Saez, Emmanuel Saez, and Gabriel Zuckman, uh, both of them from the University of California, Berkeley, economists, fairly well-known economists. Uh, you may remember Thomas Piketty 
from France did the capital in the 21st century. Uh, Saez and Zuckman's book is called The Triumph of Injustice. And they are, uh, they are suggesting huge, huge tax rates on wealth from 2% to 6% a year on wealth. Over 50 million, it's 2%, and over a billion, it's 6% a year. Uh, they're raising tax rates back up to 90% on income, uh, death tax at that. It's a huge thing to try to redistribute uh, income in the U.S. to help the poor. They argue that the inequality of income in the U.S. is so high that we have to do something to address inequality. Now, what I want to do is go through this with you very slowly, if I may, as an economist and not as a Republican or a Democrat or a liberal or a conservative or a right wing or a left wing. I want to go through it with you in the math because you guys more than anyone need to understand the issue of redistribution. Now redistribution occurs when you take from someone who has more and give that something to someone who has less. Are, are you with me? Mm -hmm. You take from the rich guy and you give to the poor guy. You, you with me? Now, whenever you take something from someone who has a little bit more, that person's incentives for producing are reduced, and that person will produce a little bit less. With me? By giving it to someone who has a little bit less, you provide that person with an alternative source of income other than working, and that person, too, will produce a little bit less. The theorem here, and I'm going to tell you, it's just math. Whenever you redistribute income, you always reduce total income, period. Now, the lemma, uh, the, the lemma of this theorem is equally as cool. The lemma is the more you redistribute income, the greater will be the decline in total income. Y you with me again? Lastly, the limit function of this theorem is really beautiful. If you were able to redistribute all income so that everyone came out exactly the same, there will be no income. Let, let me explain it to you carefully, because so I want you to really understand this, because you see it in your legislatures all the time as redistribution plans. To get total equality of income, what you have to do is you have to tax everyone who makes above the average income 100% of the excess. And what you have to do also is everyone who makes below the average income, you have to subsidize them up to the average income. That's the only way you can assure that everyone comes out exactly the same. Now, if you actually did do that, if you taxed everyone who made above the average income 100% of the excess, and you subsidize everyone below the average income up to the average income, I'll stipulate today, Counselor, everyone will come out the same at no income whatsoever. Remember that theorem because it's just plain math. I, I used to t try to teach it to my students, and of course they'd never work for their living. They didn't have any idea who this FICA guy was who was going to take all their income from them. You know, they didn't know that. So I tried to put it in terms that they would understand, uh, in student terms. And what I used to tell them is, if I ran this class the way your government runs your country, what I would do is I would flunk all the A students out and I give all the F students scholarships. Now, before you giggle, my A students happen to be a little bit smarter than my F students. So once I change the rules of the game, my A students are able to get lower grades than my F students, because they never randomly make the mistake of guessing a correct answer. My A students still get all the scholarships. My F students are still flunked out. I have not changed the distribution of grades one iota but what have I done? I've destroyed the entire quality of the educational process. Mm -hmm. Taxes cannot change the distribution of income. Believe me, in, uh, in Venezuela, the distribution is equally as bad as it is in any capitalist country. But what you can do is change the volume of income. And every revolution on earth has fought to change the distribution of income. None of them succeeds but all of them succeed in destroying total income. This is the, this is the force of debate today, uh, and you should be well aware this is what Zuckman, Piketty, Saez, all of these Mirleys, all the MIT uh, Berkeley economists are putting out. If you want to have some fun, get that, 
get that book, The Triumph of Injustice, and read, and you, you'll really see how they're putting the framework of the political debate. And then if you really want to have some fun, get a short story by Kurt Vonnegut. If you read the short story by Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut, which is called uh, uh, Harrison Bergeron, read that about the ultimate extreme of redistribution, where you not only redistribute income, you redistribute height, IQ, good looks, everything, and we're, it, it's really disgusting. But, dude, this is the battle of the century. This, this time period, this is the issue. And just remember, whenever you redistribute income, you lose total income. And if you've got total equality, you'll have it only at no income. That was excellent. Hey, let me ask a quick question off the, sure. off the card here is, if we have a country that is probably one of the best, greatest countries in the, in the world, with the best economies, uh, why is it we have people that want to change that if we're doing so well? The ultimate question. I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, you know, they all want to come here and then they want to change it. Isn't that interesting? That's what my family did, too. I mean, you know, we came here. I mean, you par probably aren't totally Native American, are you? <laughs> Just joking. I mean, but, but we all came here as a chance to have an opportunity. And, you know, this battle between the growthists and the redistribution has been going on since the beginning of time. But I want to make sure you understand we're not losing. The highest marginal income tax rate in 1946 was... 92 and a half percent. That was 1946. I mean, the same laws as today. That had to be voted in by the House, had to be voted in by the U.S. Senate, and it had to be signed into law by the President of the United States. I mean, imagine the political debate back in 1946. Okay, left winger and a right winger. The left right winger says, okay, 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 look, at, I'll go along with 92 and a half percent. I will, but 95 percent, that's gouging. And the lefty says, yeah, 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 90%, that's a giveaway to the fat cat Richies. You know, we've won a huge, the rate's down to 37%. The corporate rate is way, way down. Uh, right to work states, how many other? Arizona, what was 1947? You know, uh, there were two others, I think, at the same time, Arkansas and Florida. And by the way, back then, Arkansas was Florida. And, <laughs> and, and you know, if you look at it now, how many states are right to work? I mean, huge numbers are, if you look at how many states got rid of the death tax, 1976, only one state in the United States did not have a state death tax, and that was Nevada. All right, one. Th four of them had pickup taxes. The others, but all the rest of the states had death tax. Now it's what, that's down to 17 have death taxes, gift and estate taxes. It's amazing the advances. It used to be that, you know, a manufacturer's suggested retail price was no, not suggested. It was the law of the land. You couldn't discount products. There was, it was illegal to be a Walmart. It was illegal to be a Costco. All of these discount places were illegal. Now, they're all over the place. I mean, we are moving so much in the right direction. I just want you all to know that we're not losing. We're winning big time. Just keep up the fight for free market pro-growth economics, and we'll win big time. Well said. Okay, as you have written in Alex Rich State's Poor States, there's a crisis facing many public pension plans across the nation. What are some suggestions for reform options for our policymakers should we consider? Is there any chance I can get all of these states to remove their income tax 10 years ago? No. Okay, Sorry. if you look at where the problems are, you can see where they, they are in states that are having problems. And the problems are very closely related to status policies in the states that are having them. I mean, Kentucky, which is a catastrophic economic system uh, situation, the unfunded liabilities are, are what, 50% it's unfunded. Illinois, I think, is tied for the bottom. Uh, and they're the same thing. I mean, I, I told you the story. I, can, I, can I tell them? Yeah, please. I was giving a talk at, uh, in, the, uh, in the convention center in Nashville for a state group. And, I, I, I was going in to give the talk, and I overheard these two people talking fairly loudly, and I shouldn't have done it, but I overheard them. And the one guy said to the other guy, he said, did you hear about the Tennessee family here for generations? They made all their love living and everything here, and then all of a sudden last year they packed up all their belongings and bags and they moved to Illinois. Did you hear that story? And the other guy said, well, no, I didn't. And the first guy said, and you never will. <laughs> The best solution to pension funds is, number one, having economic growth. That's it. 
and that really is state economic. Number two, you shouldn't have, un you shouldn't have defined benefit plans. Uh, state government should have defined contribution plans so that it never can have an unfunded liability. And lastly, if you're caught in one of these uh, horrible, horrible spiral, death spirals of their pension funds, and there are a lot of states that have real problems, and especially if you can imagine, let's say we have a downturn in the next two or three years at some stage, I mean, all of those will come starkly to the fore. Uh, one of the things you can do, I mean, most states exempt pension fund benefits from state income tax. That's exactly the wrong thing to do. What you want to do is make the pension fund subject to the tax. And if you have a pension fund uh, that is 50% unfunded, all it would take to make it fully funded is a 33% tax on the benefits putting back into the pension fund itself. That would make the pension fund fully funded. Now, when you're talking to the state workers on this and you want to go to, uh, to, uh, uh, to a defined contribution plan, you should maybe suggest to the, uh, to the state employees union or whatever it is that if you'll back us, we won't do the other. Uh, but, you know, you got to at some stage going to have to address this thing and you should not make everyone else pay for the pension fund benefits of the group that gets them. And so these are the ways you can look at it and you can do it, but the best way is to have economic growth, then go to a defined contribution plan, and uh, hopefully never will you have to use the, the third plan I suggested to you. But for goodness sakes in your states, don't exempt pension benefits from state income taxes if they exist. Just don't do that. Thank you. That was well said. Okay, now talk to us about the huge economic premium for the nine states, like your home state of Tennessee, that goes without a tax on wage income. What's their secret for other state leaders as they look to eliminate their own income tax? Yeah, you, uh, one more state and we'll have all of them be no tax on any income, not just wage income. We in Tennessee, I don't know if you're aware of Tennessee, little state out there. I heard you, you know. had some good bourbon or whiskey. We have, no, the, the bur <laughs> bourbon is more Kentucky. Oh, okay. We have Jack Daniels. You have Jack, okay. Have Jack. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but if you look at, at this, we're, we just got rid of our unearned income tax, the hall tax, I think it's phases out this year. It's gone, so we got rid of the unearned income tax. I think only, uh, I think only New Hampshire now still has an unearned income tax. They call it an unearned income tax. Uh, but if you look at the nine states, I mean, if you look at those states, we, we take it over a 10-year moving average because, you know, any one of these states can have a bobble or a wiggle or a blue bubble, you know, oil prices go up or down or you have a hurricane or something like that. So using a 10-year moving average, if you look at the 10-year moving average of the nine states that have no income tax and population growth, uh, you can look at gross state product growth, you name it, you name the the measure, if you look at that and compare those nine states with the nine highest income tax rate states, the nine states with no income tax uh, beat the living bejabers out of the nine states uh, with the highest income tax rates every single year for the past 40 years. Now that's using a 10 year moving average, but I mean every, and those differences are very, very, very large. I mean, it's really very impressive the one I love, which is, is just as much as, you know, the 11 states that introduced the income tax uh, since 1960. You know, there, we've had 11 states that introduced the income tax since 1960. The first, some of you may know, was West Virginia in 1961. The last one was Connecticut. Lowell Weicker, a Republican, Yaley, uh, who introduced the income tax in 1991 there. And to sandwich between those two, you had, uh, you had Maine, you had Rhode Island, uh, you had New Jersey, uh, you had Pennsylvania, you had Ohio, you had Michigan, you had Indiana, you had Nebraska, uh, you had Illinois, you know, those are all the 11 states. If you look at each of these 11, if you look at these 11 states, all right, now what I did in this is I took all of the 11 states and compared them with the rest of the nation, all the other 39 states, all right? And if you look at it right from the time they've, they, they've put in the income tax, all right, I looked at the three years before they looked at, they put in the income tax, and I compared the latest three years in most of the major metrics of those states. Income, population, uh, labor force, employment, and tax, state and local tax revenues as well. Those 11 states, each one individually looked at. 
Each and every one of those states underperformed the rest of the nation in each and every one of those metrics. Not one exception. And that includes state and local tax revenues. I then looked at the other side of the ledger, which I looked at, uh, uh, I looked at why would they put in an income tax? Obviously to get better services. So I looked at all the service, I looked at police, I looked at fire, I looked at all this other stuff, and education. Now education, state and local, spending on education uh, is about 50 to 55% of state and local budgets, every state. So education is the big, big kahuna in, in, in really getting state and local funds. So we have measures of education done by the Department of Education. They look at fourth grade and eighth grade math and reading. And if you look at all of these public services on these 11 states that put in an income tax, every single one of them underperformed the nation except for two. And those two outperformed by just a beep, 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 little bit. There was just really no change. Uh, two of them underperformed by just a little bit. But then there were seven that had catastrophic declines in the provision of public services. Their test scores went way down, their provision, all that you saw happen in those 11 states, every single one, the one thing that was common in all of them, as soon as they put in an income tax, state employees got a huge increase in pay. And that was about it. So when you look at this stuff, believe me, supply side economics works in the states, it really does. And, and it's just amazing. And what, what we've tried to do, and not only the rich states, poor states, but a book that uh, four of us wrote together called The Wealth of States, you know, we have, a, we have 50 states in this wonderful land of ours. We have probably 80 counties in each state, maybe three or four or five municipalities each county. We have all of these data going back 100 years for each of these states. If you're imagining any policy, it's probably been done before. Maybe Idaho in 1950, not 59. Maybe it was in Maine in 1983 or Illinois in 1996. What, whatever it is, you know, Really, there is a huge database here that all of you can tap into to really see what the consequences have been of other states doing these. I'm, I'm trying to now work with states like uh, Kentucky. I work with them, and especially on property taxes. I work with Missouri. Some of you may know it's in, the, it's in rich states, this, it's rich states, poor states this year, my, my study on, that, on Missouri. I mean, it's amazing. The sales tax in Missouri if you look at some of these others, some of them, everyone thinks it's a joke. There's this little municipality out there, 412 people and 19 policemen. I mean, they're speed trap cities. <laughs> and Ian, we giggle and laugh, but they're really dysfunctional people. And they really aggregate together. There are a bunch of cities in Missouri where over 70% of the revenues came from fees, fines, and assessments. Speeding tickets, fines, and I mean, it's just amazing the complications and the difficulties that can occur. Now, Missouri, thank God, passed a law that prohibited any, any municipality, any state government of any sort, to raise more than 30% of its revenues and that. But it, it's, it's amazing the detail and stuff. You can really change your states if you dig, dig, dig down. There's a lot of dysfunction going on. I mean, in, in, in Louisville, Jefferson County, there are 147 property tax, separate property taxes. In Ohio, now this is about two or three years ago, there were 1,440 separate income taxes. In my little place where I have my farm in Burkesville, Kentucky, population 1,200 people. They have an add-on income tax in that little city of one and three quarters percent. And you wonder why we're declining. I mean, it, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the states and I hope you guys get really into it because the further down you dig, the more you can really change the dynamics of what you're doing. Uh, well, I've lectured enough, sorry, but no, 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 it's, it's, it's really serious stuff and it's very hard to explain to people because it takes a lot of work to get down to these numbers to see it. I mean, Missouri, 2,331 separate sales tax jurisdictions in Missouri. 2,330, within each of those dis, uh, uh, ju jurisdictions, there are up to eight separate taxing authorities that have the authorization to impose a sales tax. On average, 4.7 uh, authorities have it in any one of the districts. They range from 4% to 12%. You know, that means you have about 3,000 people on average in a sales tax jurisdiction. The people who buy there don't live there. There's no local government coming from this stuff. That's the average, by the way, is 3,000. Some of them are much less than that. Some of them are more than that. It's crazy. And the, the legislature in, in, in Missouri took all of these. There are like 25 separate categories of sales tax. 
you know, scales, you know, like groceries and stuff and every item there. You then look at different buyers, 501c3s and all these different categories, you know, are different sales tax. This thing is the biggest mess you've ever seen. It's a rat mess. And then the legislator in Missouri put it in their constitution. You can't get it out. What do you do? I mean, this is the type of stuff that I'd love to see you guys go into because good economics can really be implemented. And you guys are the, you, you're where the tire hits the road. You're where it happens. And that's why I love you guys so much and love what you do. Alec is the best. Aren't they wonderful? They are just the best. <clears throat> so we do have a few minutes left. So I'm going to throw this out here. 2020 is coming up. It's going to be a big election year for all of us from the federal on down. Um, could you share with us um, historically how economics has played into past elections and how that might play into our 2020 election? Yeah. As, as long as you'll let me pull it away from the impeachment stuff, which scares the heck out of me. No, we're not talking We've, about that. Well, we're you talking. know, it's also, but it's a big, it's the elephant in the room. Exactly. And it really is an elephant in the room. And if I could get my arms around it, uh, I would talk about it. I don't know what the effect's going to be. But there are two elections I look to for the 2020 at present. Now, I'll do my big paper next April. I think it will be April, May, where I did the same one in 2016. Uh, but the two elections I like to look to, and the first one was 19, uh, 1972. Uh, in 1972, we had a relatively unattractive uh, Republican candidate who was not very well liked. Uh, he ran for the presidency. He ran against a guy named George McGovern, who was an avowed socialist at the time, had the Demogrant and all that stuff and very much like Elizabeth Warren. And uh, Nixon won the election 49 states out of 50. The only state Nixon lost was Massachusetts. So that's one election I look to because there is a similarity uh, on, the, on the brand of economics these people are looking at today. The other election I look to is, uh, is uh, 1982, I mean, excuse me, 1984. When Reagan was elected in 1980, uh, we won 51% of the vote. Uh, Jimmy Carter, the incumbent, got 42% of the vote. And as some of you may remember, John Anderson got 7% of the vote. Reagan came in without a decisive victory. We did win, all right, but without a decisive victory. And he was mocked and criticized by many, by almost all. I mean, here he was. He was a racist. He was a bigot. He was a guy who spoke lines that other people wrote. wrote. Uh, he was a Western cowboy, a gunslinger, you know, all of these things. And th that's just what the Republicans said about him. <laughs> he, and by the way, if you ever get a chance to go to Rancho del Cielo uh, in the, in the, in the uh, thing, I had him put there all the speeches by fellow Republicans about Reagan before he became president. It's disgusting uh, what they said. And when Reagan came in, he was very unpopular. I think his favorables were 35, 40%. In the third month of his term in office, uh, as you'll remember, it was horrible, but he was shot by Hinckley, and he lived, thank God. Uh, he was rushed to the hospital, and during his recuperation, his favorables went from 35 40% uh, on up to 75%. I mean, everyone in the country was rooting for him. I mean, they were really going for it. It's in that environment that we were able to pass our two bills. One was uh, Graham Lada, Phil Graham and the Lada, uh, which was the spending bill, and the other one was Hans Conable, which was our tax rate cut bill. We passed those two, a Democrat and a Republican co-sponsor of each of those bills, excuse me, and uh, we got it through. They phased in the tax cuts, which meant that the tax cuts didn't really begin until January 1st, 1983. During this phase-in period, the favorables for Reagan dropped sharply, and by the time we got to the elections of 1982, Reagan was an all-time low. I think 30, 35%, really unpopular president. Uh, and we got hammered in the 82 election. And then January 1st, 1983 hit. And the tax bill took effect. It has always amazed me how tax cuts don't work until they take effect. <laughs> and then they work like mad. Between January 1st, 1983 and June 30th, 1984, that's 18 months, is it? year and a half, the U.S. economy grew by 12% in real terms. U.S. real GDP growth was at an annual compound rate of 8% per annum, Chinese growth rates, I mean, seriously. 
By the time we got to 1984, we had an election, uh, you know, with a lovely Democrat. I knew Fritz Mondale very well. He's a fine, fine man. He's very honorable, very good, very worthy candidate and opponent. He wasn't the weird George McGovern stuff. And yet Reagan still won 49 out of 50 states. Thanks God, uh, Mondale won his own home state of Minnesota. I mean, but these are the two elections that I look to very carefully because I think both of them have object lessons with regard to Trump. Number one, his opponent will be much more like George McGovern than anything else. And number two, if something doesn't happen between now and then and the economy stays really strong, he'll be looking very much like Ronald Reagan did in 1984. So those are the two economic political lessons that I look to for the next year uh, for the election 2020, if that makes any sense to any of you. But that is extremely helpful. Um, so we're about out of time. Um, since you brought up Reagan, I'm gonna tell a quick story that uh, some of us had the honor of being at the Reagan Ranch two, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, I think. And um, if you haven't been there, please, please try and make that happen. It is, it's pretty awe-inspiring. Awe but one of the docents had told us we had this, he has this big barn there, and of course he had his mounted, uh, the, uh, the uh, ranch is about 688 acres, and so they had a mounted uh, CIA coverage that because they would go out riding a lot and they had a big barn and on this side of the barn was all of the hay that the taxpayers paid for for all of the government horses and on this side of the barn was the hay for Ronald Reagan's horses and he paid for that hay and one of the the, the staffers said you know Mr. President I don't think the taxpayers are really going to worry about you having you paying for your own hay over here, considering the big picture. And he said, "No, I will not have any of my horses on tax welfare." <laughs> <laughs> that was Reagan, Dr. Laffer. Thank, thank you. You have been pleasure. always amazing. Thank, thank you for you, all the work you do here thank for you. us. We appreciate it. Thank you.